Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays and 4Ks here. Today we're talking 4 and we are talking about from Paramount. And I will apologize some of these have been out for a minute now. Uh, I kind of like in because I find that uh, folks that watch these videos take it more if you talk about multiple things. Um, I've got a lot to say about at least a couple of these, so let's get into this here. Um, this I was waiting for, and that is Chinatown on 4K. Very exciting for me, uh, especially really cinephile me, because um, this was a really seminal movie when I was in college. That was when I really went full bore into film. Like, I, I had entered college to study ostensibly marine biology, and about midway through, I realized... Uh, actually, I took an organic chemistry course, and I was like, mm, yeah, no. No, this isn't going to work for me, and I, I needed to find an alternative, and film was already something I was very much into. I had been working in video stores since I was a junior in high school, and I shifted my major to cinema studies, to you know, calm arts as it were at the time. But this movie was such a big deal to me that it was during my video store years, I had a couple movies that stayed in my staff pick section for most of the time. Like I would, I think we had four or five slots and I would swap out a lot of them, you know, every three, four months, sometimes sooner. But Chinatown and King of Comedy were two all-timers for me and two that I just couldn't take out because I just thought they were so great. And so Chinatown, I w I've watched a lot. And it's a movie that I still think is one of the great films of the 1970s, which is one of the great decades in cinema. And so that's saying a lot. Uh, but it's one that coming back to it, with this 4K, I was just reminded how great it is. And, you know, I'm not going to go into detail about the transfer itself, although I think the transfer looks great. Um, I'm kind of the, you know, Heath Holland did a nice video about this that I recommend checking out where he talks about, <clears throat> you know, transfers and things like that. And um, I think that this looks better than it's ever looked, you know, and... There is some grain there. I don't know the degree to which the grain may or may not have been scrubbed. I know Paramount's been taking a lot of a sort of a critical beating on YouTube and in some reviews about their treatment of some of their stuff, but it always looks pretty good to me. You know what I mean? Like I'm maybe not the most discerning in the, when it comes to film grain and how much is there or how much isn't. Um, so... Hopefully you're coming to this channel not for that, but maybe for some context, which is what I like to do here. Um, but this is a great release, and I will say off, like right off the bat, probably another like, you know, favorite of 2024 kind of release. So, uh, yeah, Chinatown, real classic. Um, this one, it's it's a just a wonderful, you know, postmodern noir, and it has Jack Nicholson at the height of his powers and one of his greatest performances is Jake Giddies, a 1930s private detective who has a lot of confidence, has a lot of um, a weary, you know, seen-it-all attitude, a cynicism, an arrogance. And it's just one of those things where it's neat to see Nicholson play that character because he can nail that, but also the idea of a guy who really doesn't know <laughs> much about anything. Like, I mean, he, he figures out a few things and some key things, but some of the main, you know, plot twists, if you will, elude him completely, you know? And, uh, 
I think the other thing I enjoy about it, there's a lot of things to enjoy, but one other thing is that the 70s is a great decade for paranoid thrillers. Things like the films of Alan Pakula, which I talk about a lot here, Clute and Parallax View and All the President's Men um, are great examples of incredible paranoid thrillers of the 70s. Uh, and this sort of dovetails real nicely into that, although it's in the midst of those films. It has a paranoia. It has a suspicion of and distrust of large institutions. Uh, it has, uh, you know, discovery of corruption, you know, which in watching the movie now, I feel like it resonates as much as it ever did because we live in a society where um, with social media and the 24-hour news cycle and everything, there is controversy and uh, revelations about all kinds of um, larger corporations or individuals that come out almost daily. And we've gotten to the point where it's, it's, it's pretty overwhelming and it's not really shocking anymore. But, you know, this is a film that's made post, well, in the, in the sort of wake of Vietnam and in the midst of Watergate uh, you know, right around that time. And I feel like that is where you start to get a real distrust of, you know, government institutions, government on all levels, local, <laughs> uh, you know, federal, what, ha what have you. Um, and so this movie really taps into that. And, and I just find it to be a, a real nice compliment to those other films while also being a great, look at noir and sort of dismantling of it in some way. Uh, but yeah, just, just incredible. This, this particular time I was focused a little bit on the things that the Jake Giddy's character feels like he has under control. Like he has this trick he uses to track people that he's monitoring where he takes, uh, pocket watches, cheap pocket watches, I guess, and will put them under the back tire of a car that the, you know, surveilled person is in or has parked with the idea that when he comes back in the morning or when one of his associates comes back, they can see when the watch is crushed and they know exactly what time that person has left wherever they were. Uh, that's one thing he uses. Another trick he uses is, you know, knocking out a taillight on a car so they're e more easy to track through the city. I think that's an interesting little bit. Even with all these little clever tricks and, you know, his his history working for the district attorney, which sort of is touched on, but we don't fully get a sense of exactly what happened uh, with him. And I kind of love that. But, you know, just sort of a guy who knows a lot of people, who knows the one of the main lieutenants in the uh, Los Angeles Police Department, he just really gets in over his head in investigating Hollis Mulray, who's this guy who works for Water and Power. He's an engineer, and he is killed, and it's a, it's a question of who did it and why. And it becomes, it's this giant controversy about water, you know, controversy and um, some strange stuff that's happening in the midst of a drought. But um, it's, it's a just amazing story that I get, more and more into every time and it's beautifully shot by John A. Alonzo I just I just think it's a it's a gorgeous movie an incredibly well acted movie um, in terms of context you know it's it's I don't want to say it's like one of the last great Hollywood films that, because it's part of the new Hollywood in a way but it's also you know bigger than some of the, the 70s stuff, bigger than like a taxi driver, you know, and and things like that would come after it. Um, but, you know, just in terms of Jack Nicholson, let's talk about that for a second. So Nicholson, a real counterculture guy, comes up through Roger Corman, uh, you know, one of the, I think one of the writers on The Monkees, well, he wrote Head, uh, the movie Head. So he's doing things like Psych Out and... Um, you know, Hell's Angels on Wheels, 
for Corman, he's doing a lot of interesting stuff in the you know earlier '60s, well, the mid '60s, like uh, sh- the shooting and ride in the whirlwind from Monty Hellman, both really great westerns. In fact, he does um, Flight to Fury and shooting in the and uh, ride in the whirlwind. Those are really great, um, but he's still coming up, if you will. Uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and then Psych Out, and then the, then Head, which he wrote. Um, and then he does Easy Rider in 1969. And that is such a watershed film that it basically changes the way the studio looks at movie making. And they start to look to people like Dennis Hopper, who directed the film, um, as, you know, saviors. How do we make a movie that will appeal to people? You know, uh, because the audience is changing. And I feel like we're going through that right now, actually, too. I feel like we're seeing all this talk of movie theaters dying and movies dying. And I think it's not necessarily what's happening, but I do think the audience is changing. I do think young people are are not as into movies. And, and I think eventually we're going to find a way that there will be some young people that are really into it, but you know, maybe it won't ever be as big as it was in terms of cinema with a capital C, if you will. But anyway, I don't want to get too, too off on that track. So Nicholson does easy rider. He does five easy pieces for Bob Rafelson in 1970. Uh, another big one for him. Um, drive. He said, which he, uh, did he write and direct? I can't remember if he wrote and directed it. He definitely directed it. I feel like he wrote it too. That's a that's a lesser talked about movie. Then he does Carnal Knowledge with Mike Nichols in 71, A Safe Place with Henry Jaglum in 71, uh, back to uh, Bob Ravelson with King of Marvin Gardens in 1972. He is on an incredible run here. Then he does in 73, maybe my favorite of all his films, and that's the last detail for uh, the great Hal Ashby. And then he does Chinatown. I mean, that's just a remarkable run of fascinating films. And after that, he's still doing interesting stuff. He does Cuckoo's Nest in 75. He does um, The Shining, obviously, in 1980. And then things like The Fortune for Mike Nichols, which I really like, or you know, The Passenger for Antonioni. I mean, he's doing all kinds of interesting stuff in this period. But uh, Chinatown really is one of those performances that you're like, wow. And the fact that he's such a charismatic, handsome guy that he can wear a bandage on his nose for like, I want to say like half the movie and still, still come off cool. Like, I don't know how that works. It's just a certain kind of actor that can do that. So then on top of Nicholson, we have Faye Dunaway, who's also having a really big moment. But her big moment is actually almost starting around the time Nicholson's is with things like Bonnie and Clyde for Arthur Penn in 67, then the Thomas Crown Affair with Steve McQueen in 68 for Norman Jewison, um, and, you know, Little Big Man, Puzzle of a Downfall Child. She's doing stuff for Frank Perry, you know, Doc. Um, so she's... I mean, the the real big one for her is Bonnie and Clyde. And I feel like she's f- doing interesting films after that. But Chinatown is maybe the next really big one for her. You know, as much as I'm interested in things like The Three Musketeers and, uh, like I said, Doc, um, Chinatown is a real big one for her. And then she goes on to do The Four Musketeers, Towering Inferno, and... Uh, three days of condor and then network and network is another like for me like boom that's like huge for her um but she's really good in this and it's it's just an incredible you know group of actors on top of everything else you have john houston as noah cross who's fantastic uh continually mispronouncing jake giddy's name on purpose john hillerman diane ladd Roman Polanski himself, who directed, uh, James Hong, Bruce Glover, um, uh, Crispin Glover's dad is one of the, uh, guys who helps out with, um, Nicholson. And I always forget that. And if you look at Bruce Glover, you can see how much he looks like Crispin. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, similarity. Burt Young would go on to do Rocky. Of course, it's a remarkable cast. Um, but just a really, 
great movie and one that I continue to come back to. But <clears throat> this this set is really great because it includes, of course, our digital code. But it includes Chinatown. There's only a 4K here. There's no Blu-ray. And then, of course, two, The Two Jakes, which was the sequel that Nicholson directed. And I think that's... I'm not actually sure if that's been on Blu-ray before this, but it might have been. Uh, part of me says it was, but I'm not sure, so I'm going to check. But um, that sequel comes... Uh, yeah, it has been on Blu-ray before, back in 2020. Um, that comes out in 1990, so many years later. So we're talking about anniversary editions here. This movie's 50, 50 years old now, which is crazy. Um, but anyway, so uh, one of the reasons this package is so great is that they have included tons of features, some of the older stuff. In fact, most of the older stuff I think that's ever been put on disc. And your concern might be that oh they're putting stuff on the 4k it's hd i think most of it some of it may even be sd you know going back there and I, that doesn't really bother me if i see an, an old interview in sd especially if it's about taking up space on a 4k disc versus potentially um causing compression in the actual movie part of it which i didn't see any compression um this does have a, a new feature uh, a state of mind author sam wasson on chinatown and he wrote a really great book, apparently, on Chinatown, which he talks about in his video, which now I have to check out. I don't have that book, and I really, really want to read about it and everything went in, that went into the film. It sounds like a story that I only know little parts of, you know. Uh, it has a commentary with screenwriter Robert Town and director David Fincher. Now, that's very cool. I do remember that from a previous release, and I do remember really liking that. I think Fincher... I like these commentaries where you bring in somebody like uh, Steven Soderbergh to talk to John Borman about Point Blank. And in this case, you know, uh, Fincher just really loves this movie. It clearly is part of his DNA in a way. If you watch something like Zodiac, you can feel it. You can feel that it's in there. Um, and so he's got a lot of questions. And it's great to hear uh, Robert Towns' stories about the film. Uh, Chinatown Memories the trilogy that never was <clears throat> this was supposed to be part of three a three film thing but it did not happen um i think mostly because of the the failure of the two jakes but i'm not exactly sure exactly why th this didn't happen but then there's the water and power chinatown and appreciation chinatown the beginning and the end chinatown filming chinatown the legacy this is something like Close to three hours, I think, worth of stuff, not including the commentary. So it's a really, really stacked release, and I love that. And plus you get the two Jakes, which I'm not really going to talk about because I haven't seen it in a long time, and I can barely remember what it's about. I know it's about oil, but that's kind of the, the end of my memory of it. But I am looking forward to checking it out. I'm glad it's here. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a 4K or a Blu-ray. It is just a Blu-ray, but this is a great release. Uh, I'm sure you'll see some other more critical in terms of the scan, uh, you know, thoughts. But as a movie fan, I just think this is a really wonderful release. So I have to recommend that. Now, on top of that, and this one definitely has taken some heat in terms of the transfer, but Once Upon a Time in the West, okay? This is Sergio Leone's film uh, from 1968. And... It is one of those movies that I, I, let's talk about Sergio Leone for a second. This is a guy who didn't make that many films, and the fact that we all know who he is really speaks to how resonant uh, the films that he did make are. Um, you know, the Dollars Trilogy, three now really seminal westerns that everybody knows made a star out of Clint Eastwood and are considered unassailable classics at this point. You have, I mean, but you know, just so people know, he made a movie in 1961 called the Colossus of Rhodes, which is kind of a sword and sandal peplum kind of film. Not that great. Uh, I don't know the full story behind that, but obviously he wasn't quite there in terms of the filmmaker. He is in 
1964 when he makes a fistful of dollars and really announces himself and and shows the style and the sensibilities the sense of humor the dark comic uh approach he has to the west and you know the bleakness of it he has a bleakness to his viewpoint that i've always liked um so he does fistful of dollars in 64 65 he follows it up with for a few dollars more which for me one of the probably the greatest sequel of all time and my f- personal favorite of all the films he made that's just me i know it's crazy i know a lot of people will say what are you talking about because in 1966 he makes the good the bad and the ugly and that movie is you know one of tarantino's favorite films maybe his favorite if you ask him on a certain day it seems like uh it's just one of those incredible epic westerns that you can't argue is amazing and i agree I think I just really love the Lee Van Cleef and the Eastwood of for a few dollars more, just a little bit more. Uh, but good, the bad, and the ugly, incredible, obviously. Uh, but so that what's really cool now is we're looking at this and we, we've got a 4K for Fistful and for a few dollars more, good, the bad, and the ugly, and now Once Upon a Time in the West. And this film, I think, is really him hitting... Some would say the pinnacle of his Western, you know, I mean, there are those that argue it's better than Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I think they're both fantastic. I think the the two of those films together is just an incredible duo, ultimately. But let's talk about Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, This movie is just amazing to watch. And, And this is a scan that, to me... Again, looks pretty good. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I don't want to get into the weeds on the scan. There are other channels you can go to to have screenshots and what have you. I don't necessarily put a ton of stock in some of that stuff because for me, to my eye, this looks good. And to be honest, we're not going to get another one. So your choice is this or some lower definition version. And I get that. That's on you if you want to do that. It's totally fine. I like this. I think it looks good. This film... Uh, has an incredible cast and one thing that I think is underrated about Leone is his ability to cast faces and obviously faces are a big part of his cinema you know he's one of the first guys I can think of to use the you know cinemascope widescreen frame to fill it up with a face like that was just not something people were doing they were using it to show landscapes and beautiful sets and just multiple like groups of people just this beautiful uh format that you could show so much to so to squish one face into it was just not something people were doing around that time and i think that there's something about that that he just he understood the power of the human face so even extras even guys who run the train station or the telegraph office in a leone film are just chiseled and they look authentic in this way that i can't even explain um, yeah, like the guy who plays the station agent at the open of this film is just something else. And when you open with faces like Jack Elam, Jack Elam is one of my favorite character actors and has one of the most <laughs> grizzled faces you can imagine. And it's so funny. His career goes from like 40s film noir to, uh, Disney to, you know, because he's doing like Disney movies, I want to say around this time, you know, he's doing I actually love him in um, Never a Dull Moment with Dick Van Dyke, which is a gangster movie. It's a great role for him. But anyway, he's got a great face and there's just a great bit where this fly keeps buzzing around his face. And so you see his face, then you see Woody Strode's face. And I, I think another thing that was really important to Leone is sound design, you know, uh, the sound of punches, the sound of bullets, the silence, uh, the wind, like all the little bits that you can pick up or not pick up in his films. He, he really paid attention to that, and I think it elevates the movies that he made. Um, but the opening of Once Upon a Time of the West is one of his best openings in any movie, and the sound design is definitely part of that because there's very little dialogue. It's building tension. It's at this train platform there's a sound of a squeaky windmill outside that you keep hearing uh the telegraph is another sound 
uh, there's water dripping. There's a guy cracking his knuckles. There's a fly buzzing again around Elam's face. He's trying to blow it off his face. And then him capturing it with his gun barrel and listening to it buzz. The sound of the train pulling up. Um, a rifle being cocked and loaded. And at 11 minutes and 30 seconds, I think there's almost been no dialogue. And Bronson shows up as harmonica. And the harmonica kicks in. And then we get the booming Leone gunshots. And it's just truly epic. It's about 15 minutes, this opening. And, you know, the other thing that goes along with sound, of course, is music. And one of the great collaborations in cinema of all time is Ennio Morricone and Sergio Leone. The two go together almost better than any composer-director duo I can think of because they definitely set a tone and a feeling and an emotion. And this is one of the, uh, Morricone's best scores. It's, it's, more, it's almost more emotional, more lush than some of his other stuff. Um, really, really powerful. And then, of course, you've got another really remarkable choice in putting Henry Fonda in this film as Frank, and he's the bad guy. And that was a very controversial choice and one that really took a lot of talking into uh, because Fonda was such a... had these beautiful blue eyes that you associate with uh, a good guy. And he played a lot of great good guy roles. You think about 12 Angry Men. You think about, I mean, the Oxbow Ins. I mean, there's tons of Fonda being a good guy roles. But he is so sinister and so powerful in this villain role. And there's just something unexpected. And I can't imagine what it was like for people in 1968, regular moviegoers who were used to Henry Fonda of the good guy type. And then they see him in this and are just like, wow, what? It must have been shocking. So you've got Jason Robards. You've got uh, Keenan Wynn. You've got Lionel Stander, one of the great voices in cinema of all time. Um, it is a remarkable epic story and I think this is a really nice release um, this one comes with a 4K and a Blu-ray so we get the 4K in this case they haven't tried to put a bunch of features on the 4K if I recall I think the 4K may not even have does it not have the commentary? There's a new commentary on the Blu-ray. Uh, the host of the Spaghetti Western podcast do a commentary. And then there's a commentary with contributions from directors John Carpenter, John Milius, Alex Cox. is a great Western fan. He's all over physical media in terms of commentaries on Westerns, especially Spaghetti Westerns. And obviously made his own Spaghetti Western with Straight to Hell uh, at some point. Film historians Sir Christopher Frayling, Dr. Sheldon Hall, and cast and crew. So that's an old commentary, but a great one. There's also a new look back with Leonard Malton, which is very good. Uh, and then the older stuff like An Opera of Violence, The Wages of Sin, Something to Do with Death, Railroad Revolutionizing the West, Locations Then and Now, etc. So a really nice package between the 4K and the Blu-ray. And just a classic film, you know, between this and... Uh, Chinatown, you've got two really, really wonderful classic. Um, one case, you know, modern modern noir, postmodern noir, and another case, a Western epic. Um, just a little bit more here. We'll talk about The Crow, shifting gears a little bit. You know, admittedly not the same status as the films I'm talking about, but I think a very interesting and stylish film. And I will say... Uh, great looking 4K, like maybe the, I mean, maybe the best of this group so far. It's just really stunning uh, transfer. Um, director Alex Proyas from 1994. Um, he would go on to make Dark City, which is a favorite of mine and which I really hope gets a 4K at some point. Uh, one of those directors that I, I really like, but I found kind of got lost in the studio system, you know, doing things like iRobot and I actually like knowing, but um, Gods of Egypt, things like that, where it's just not quite as successful or interesting or as original as this film or Dark City, especially, which is a, you want to talk about a noir uh, on its own level. 
it's doing some really interesting stuff combining science fiction and noir and this film is doing a little bit of that too um it is of course about a rock guitarist played by the late uh brandon lee of course one of the reasons this film is remembered is surrounding the horrible tragic death of brandon lee that came during the production of this film and so that overshadows really everything but I think it's unfortunate because he gives a great performance and I think the film is, in, you know, really interesting and now is being remade. So there's a level of um, notoriety that hopefully this older version, this is now 30 years old, uh, this older version of the film will get some attention based on the new film, get some eyes on it. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely interesting. Uh, you know, cast, including su- such folks as... Ernie Hudson from Ghostbusters, David Patrick Kelly from The Warriors and all kinds of Walter Hill films, John Polito uh, from the Coen Brothers movies. You know, it's it's a fascinating cast and it's an interesting movie. Anyway, so Eric Draven uh, and his fiance are brutally killed by a ruthless gang of criminals and Draven is watched over by this crow and returns from the grave to exact revenge. So it is a revenge movie through and through. Um, and this is the new steel book. So it has sort of an outer case and then you have the actual steel book. And this one is just a 4k and, um, it does come with a digital code, but, uh, like I said, it's a really memorable film and one that I hadn't seen in such a long time. But one of the things that I remember about it was I was big into music circa 1994 and one of the things that the studios were doing around that time was they were putting out uh, soundtracks. They would put together soundtracks where artists would perform new songs for a movie. You know, things like, I remember one of my first CD purchases ever was The Last Action Hero, which had a bunch of new songs from like ACDC and Megadeth and this one... uh, I want to say they're all new, but I, I, I'm not actually sure that they're all brand new songs. In fact, I know a couple of them are not now that I'm looking at it. But one of the big releases, there was a lot of alternative radio at the time, college radio, and they were playing the heck out of Burn, the Cure song that, that is the first track on that soundtrack, uh, Dead Souls from Nine Inch Nails, Ghost Rider, the Rollins Band. Um, there was a song called um, It Can't Rain All the Time by Jane Syberry, Time Baby 3 by Medicine, which is a song that I totally remember for some reason, just stood out to me. Uh, Darkness by Rage Against the Machine, Milk Toast by Helmet, uh, The Big Empty by the Stone Temple Pilots, Color Me Once by the Violent Femmes, uh, Snake Driver, Jesus and Mary Tra- Chain, um, you know, Machines of Love and Grace. It was this great industrial rock, alternative, dark goth soundtrack. And I think that really helps elevate the movie because it's not quite wall to wall, but there's a lot of songs there. I just listed like a dozen songs. And if you run those back to back, I mean, you're talking about like, you know, 30 something minutes of music. So they're worked into the film in such a way that I, I always found that it was, um, it was, it made the movie better you know, one of those, but, uh, great special features here as well. We have new, uh, shadows and pain designing the crow sideshow collectibles an interview with Edward R. Pressman. It's got an audio commentary with Alex Proyas, which I remember really liking another audio commentary with Jeff most and screenwriter, John Shirley behind the scenes, featurettes, a profile on James O'Barr, extended scenes, deleted footage montage. It's a really nice package, like low key, one of the better 4ks, to come out of Paramount in a while and just a nice release. So if you're into it, I think this is a high recommend for The Crow. looks really, really good. And lastly, totally shifting gears, uh, Mean Girls gets a 4K, um, another one of the sort of classic Paramount titles directed by Mark Waters, brother of the great Daniel Waters, who of course wrote Heathers. I don't think that's a, you know, a coincidence. Um, this film, of course, is remade. There's also a 4K of that as well. Um, but this cast includes Lindsay Lohan, Rachel McAdams, in a very villainous 
role as uh, Regina George, Lizzie Kaplan, Lacey Chabert, Amanda Seyfried, uh, Jonathan Bennett, Tina Fey, of course, Neil Flynn. I'm a big fan of Neil Flynn, Amy Poehler. Uh, it is, you know, a shockingly good cast. And it's all about Lindsay Lohan's character, uh, Katie Heron, and her rivalry going up against the plastics, an A-list girl click in her new school, uh, until she makes the mistake of falling for the ex of Regina George. And that is, um, that, so it's, you know, it's, it's a classic high school type movie. It's a, it's a well seen and well traveled movie and one that I know is greatly appreciated. I do like this pink, uh, 4k. This is the only pink 4k case that I know of. Um, and this includes just the 4k as well. There's no Blu-ray and a digital code. Um, special features include a commentary by director Mark Waters, which I remember enjoying, uh, included on that track is also screenwriter and actress Tina Fey. Uh, and producer Lauren Michaels. And then there's a new featurette, uh, Mean Girls Class of 04 featurettes from, you know, the older releases. Uh, Word Vomit, Blooper Reel, So Fetch, Deleted Scenes, and Optional Commentary by Mark Waters and screenwriter and actress Tina Fey. It's a nice little package, you know, and it has this nice uh, slip box sort of that, that you uh, get with it. So anyway, some classics of varying degrees coming from Paramount on 4K, and I wanted to sort of mention all of them in one big chunk to um, give you guys the most I could in one single round. So anyway, uh, highest recommend for Chinatown on 4K. That is the big winner, but uh, both Once Upon a Time in the West and The Crow looks great. I mean, uh, Mean Girls looks great too, by the way. They all, um, to me are nice upgrades from previous releases. So anyway, thank you so much for listening and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.